and you're very welcome. This is Fintan Dunn of Irish First Mothers. With me is Cathy McMahon, the founder of Irish First Mothers. What's on the schedule for today, Cathy? Today we have Claire, who was in Besbra in 1966, and she's going to have a chat with us today. Okay, this is our second living witness. Claire, you're very welcome, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Fintan. You were in Besbra in 1966. Do you want to talk a bit about how you ended up in Besbra? Yes, Cathy. In, um, in 1966, I was nursing in England and I found myself pregnant. Um, at that time, I had a varicose vein in my leg. So they told me because of all the standing with my job, I had to go and have the varicose vein removed. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was when I went into hospital to have the vein removed that they told me I was pregnant. Right. Uh, now I did kind of know, but I just didn't want to believe it even myself. Mm-hmm. But they, um, they sent me back to the hospital and... Uh, matron in the hospital was from County Cork mm-hmm. in Ireland so she must have made the arrangements I was told nothing um, except that I was going back to Ireland uh, and um, mm-hmm. one of her associates brought me to the train station a couple of days later and put me on a train for Hollyhead right. and um I was told somebody would meet me in Dublin. Mm -hmm. So I can't really remember, uh, but I think it was a priest who met me in Dublin and put me on a a train for Cork. Um, I have to say it was the most terrifying time in my life. Mm -hmm. I was so scared of what was happening to me and nobody was telling me. And I just been a, a, an eighteen year old girl from the middle of the country with the nearest town fifteen miles away. You can imagine how much I knew mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I went to i was met in Cork and I went to Bespar nursing home our mother and baby home, our unmarried mother's homes as they were then mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so um I miss, I don't know, I I think her name was Sister Benedict, but I'm not certain. Um, She sat me down and told me that um, I, the rules of the convent and all of that, and that I would be known as by a different name. Mm -hmm. And I was not to tell anybody my real name. Mm -hmm. Or I didn't really... I wasn't even allowed to talk to anybody in the in the home. How long was that now since since you were first diagnosed pregnant? How long has elapsed un- until we're at I this point? I would say possibly about two to three weeks. Two to three weeks, okay. That was very fast. Two to three weeks, yes. Yeah. And who had now, been I saying did. to you that, you know, who was it who was organising it? Who was it who was telling you where to go? Well, I know it was the matron in the hospital that got on to. Now, judging from my notes, from my notes that I got through the Freedom of Information, uh, there was a letter in that uh, from, I think, the Catholic Adoption Society in London. Right. And they they said, thank you for referring so, um, so, so, this yeah. person to us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is that the so Catholic I, Rescue... The Catholic Rescue um, Association or something, was it? Yes. That's, yes. I think it was, yeah. Or yeah. The Catholic Rescue Society. So, um, and now here you are sitting in Vespera. Here, you're, you're, where are you sitting in the front uh, living room in, in Vespera? Oh, I was sitting in a big room, um, big, cold, empty room. Mm-hmm. Um, I was too scared to even look around me. The, um, I I can't I can't honestly tell you the what happened that night or after all I know was when I went to bed 
there were about maybe 10, 15 girls in the dormitory. It was one big dormitory, and, was it? Uh, pardon? Was it one big dormitory? One big dormitory, yes. Right. And all I could hear was crying, crying, crying all the time. Yeah. Now, I thought I was the only one that was crying, but everybody seemed to be crying. Yeah. All the girls were crying. Oh. And this was a pattern every night after that. Right. Unbelievable. We were all, we, were all, we just seemed to start thinking, I suppose, when we went to bed and we just, everyone, well, you'd hear one sobbing and then the next one would start and this is the way it continued all the time. And we weren't allowed to speak to each other, even though there was one girl there uh, who I was fairly friendly with. Mm. Um, another thing I remember about it was we were always hungry. Mm-hmm. And this particular girl used to, she worked in the kitchen. And uh, she used to fill her pocket with uh, porridge oats to keep her going through throughout mm-hmm. the day. And now, I remember she offered it to me several times, but it was dry. Right. You just couldn't eat dry oats. I couldn't anyway. Mm. But it kept her going anyway. So what was the day like from, the, from you know, what time did you get up in the morning time? It, uh, we got up very early in the morning. I think it was about six o'clock and we had to go to mass. And then we came back and got whatever bit we got to eat and then we I worked in the laundry. Nice. I went straight into work. Um I remember I think once or t- was it at lunchtime I was allowed to go down to feed the baby, my baby. You after your baby was um, born. What stage of pregnancy I were you at there then? I think I was about uh five to six months. When you went pregnant. in? When I went in, yes. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so that yeah, so now, that was uh, four months. When the 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 um, nun said to me a few times that uh, my baby would be going for adoption, mm. um, but at the time when I was going into the home, I went in on the understanding that they were going to help me find a place for me and my baby afterwards. Mm-hmm. You know that I was right. being helped in some way yeah. Yeah, yeah. but that wasn't the case at all mm-hmm. um, I spoke to another nun another day she asked me why I spent so much time in the church I told her I was praying that somebody would help me to find a way of keeping my baby so she told me that day she said you will not be keeping your baby you cannot keep it because your family know nothing about it where are you going to go? You can't go back to your job. And she said, you have no place to stay. And I said, well, I thought when I was coming in here that I would be helped in some way. Mm. And she said, get that idea out of your head. Mm-hmm. So, like everything else, I did what I was told. I was terrified to answer back. Mm. But... Um, Things would have moved anyway, on then. The time yeah. came. I, mm. Sorry? Yeah, things moved on and inevitably it came closer to birth. Were you were you staying in, in Besborough or were you getting medical checks outside or how was that working? Oh, no, no. Everything was done in Besborough. In Besborough, yeah. There was a, a nun there who, I believe she was a midwife, even though it was another... Um, Inmates, as we were called then, another girl who was in there having her baby that delivered my baby. Mm. Uh, the nun was there also, but she was in and out. But it was the girl who just had her own baby that delivered my baby. And had she got any and medical I training? Begged and begged for some p- uh, pain control. Mm. Uh, I was told by the girl that the cupboards were full of it but she didn't have the key and the nun would not give anybody any painkillers because they had to suffer for the sin they committed. My God. Um, what? So uh, I was two days in labour. I went into labour on a Sunday and my son was born on the Tuesday. 
Um, after he was born, I had s- some stitches, which was very, very sore. Mm. But I also got on that vein that I went in to hospital about in London, I got an infection in that vein. Right. Um, and there again, I was nearly three weeks hopping round with one leg bent up and they would not give me anything for it. So you had absolutely um, no painkillers at all during... I got nothing. An I was antibiotics in agony, or anything? And I'm, I mean sheer agony for three weeks. Wow. With the infection. And who now, delivered? Who actually delivered your baby? Was it was it a nun or it, th- this other inmate? There was a nun in and out, but it was a girl who was in there having her own baby. She right. had her own baby. And did she have medical that. training? She was a nurse, okay. not a midwife. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She was uh, trained to be a nurse. And did you ever... Like I was. Were you ever um, examined or looked at by an actual doctor? Not that I can remember. Now, again, in my notes through the Freedom of Freedom of Information, mm-hmm. uh, it said on that that a Dr. Sutton came to see me when I had the infection mm. and that he prescribed antibiotics. That never happened. Nobody came to see me. So you received no medication... For the infection in your no. leg? Nothing. Nothing. Whatsoever. And uh, what you're talking about there, about that idea of having to suffer, um, were other girls been subjected to that too? What was the talk going around about that, if any? Well, I was told afterwards that you did not get, that they had loads of, of um, pain-killing stuff in the cupboard. Um, it was given to them for mm-hmm. the, the girls when they'd be in, in labour. But the nuns themselves refused to give it to us because we had to pay for our sins. We didn't deserve it. My God. Whatever pain we went through, we deserved that. So um, what was it actually like, the, the experience just after giving birth and in, it was in that time? It was frightening mm-hmm thing in my life. In what way? It was terrifying. Because I thought I was going to die. I didn't think anybody else was as bad as me. Mm. You know, I thought it was just me that was this bad. Yeah. I have, I was in contact through, um, through the Irish First Mothers Group with the girl that delivered my baby. Mm. Right. Since, in the last uh, two years. Mm Mm-hmm. And um, she told me that she wasn't allowed to give anybody anything. Yeah. And, and she you... even apologised to me then. She said, mm. I wasn't a nice person that time. And I'm really sorry, she said, if I wasn't nice to you. Yeah. Now, I had complained that that girl wasn't nice to me at all. Yeah. But... Um, what I didn't understand about the girl was she worked at the farm all day long. She came in in the evening, uh, went to bed whatever time she went to bed. She was awake most nights delivering babies. Yeah. So is it any wonder the girl wasn't very nice to, to people? Yeah. So she worked all through the day and she worked again through the night. Right, right. And as soon after your baby was delivered, were you allowed to see him? I don't remember seeing my baby for a while. No, he was christened and all before I knew anything about it. Really? Uh, seemingly, he was christened the day after the birth. Right. But of course, I was in such a state at the time between the stitches that I had and the infection that I had, I didn't really, I, I really wasn't aware of what was going on at all. Mm. Yeah. Do you know what weight your baby was? eight pounds two ounces because I have since had two two more children mm. and the first one of those two girls was eight pound two ounces also right yeah 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 and so, so as soon after your baby was born did you did you have to return to work 
in the convent or did you return to work in the convent? I had to return to work hopping on one leg. And I asked the nun, I couldn't straighten my leg at all. It was kind of bent in two. Yeah. And I asked the nur- nurse one day, could, or sorry, I asked the nun one day, I said, can I have a chair to sit down? Because I'm not able to stand up. And she told me, carry on, do the work I had to do, that there was nothing at all wrong with my leg, and to straighten it out. She wouldn't give me a chair. So I just had to stand against the, the big bench that we used to fold the sheets and that in. So I just had to bear with and do whatever I had to do. And, and how was um, the, you know, the feeding of your baby organised? Was your baby bottle fed or breast fed? He was bottle fed. Right. Um, I would only see him once or twice a day. Right. Somebody else fed him. So somebody else fed him during the day. Okay. Yeah. And you weren't allowed to go to him if, if, if you know, during the day if he was upset? Uh, I think, as far as I can remember, we were allowed to go down. Or I don't know, were we allowed to go down or did we just go down without permission when we'd have our lunch? I know in the evening time, uh, there was three or four of us. Two would stay watching while the other two ran in to see the babies. Right. And then when them two came out, we'd watch and the other two would run in. Right. You know, but if we were caught, we would have been killed. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know what would have happened, but we could hear the... We were listening for the, the nun and the walking stick and you would hear her coming a good bit away, so we had time to get out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. And so, what did you find, uh, you know, uh, as the plan, as it seemed to you? Was it said to you now, what happens next? How long you're going to be here? What will happen? Were you left in no. the dark or what? No, I had no idea how long I was going to be there. Um, one day we were told to get our babies ready, that um, people were coming to view and we had to bring them into this room. And it seemingly was called a viewing day or something like that. Mm-hmm. So this was about, oh, I suppose maybe seven to eight weeks after my son was born. Mm-hmm. Um, then I was called in a day or two later and the nun that called me and told me that um, my baby was going for adoption, that there was a couple that came down, saw him, that thought he was beautiful and they wanted that baby. Right. What did you say to my that? My son's parents never went to Cork. Mm-hmm. They never went to the home at all. Right. So what happened to him then? So what did you Pardon? say? What did you say when, when, when you were told that? Well, I told, I told them that I didn't want to give him up for adoption. Yeah. And I was more or less, with the, I remember she was using the back of her hand and she told me, stop talking nonsense. So... Using the back of her hand, what do you mean? Yeah, well, she just kind of ushered me away from her. Stop talking nonsense. Yes, dismissed you, yes. Mm. Mm. And then I was told that I had to bring him to Dublin myself. I had to get the train to Dublin and bring him on the train and go to St. Anne's Adoption Agency. Mm-hmm. Or the Adoption Agency in South Anne Street. I mm. don't know if it was St. Anne's or not. Mm and um, hand him over there. And when I was leaving, I was told that if I got off the train, except where I should get off it, that the the guards would pick me up and the baby and I would be brought straight back. So at every station on the way from Cork to Dublin, I was looking out for the guards at every one of them to see where they're waiting for me. And at this point, uh, you know, uh, on that journey with your own son, what with level... my own son, and I had to go into this place. I remember when I went up two years ago to reunite with my son, I told my daughter before I went in, I said, when we walk in here now, I said, there will be stairs going up along the wall on the far side. And at the top of that, sta- that first flight of stairs, there will be a door going into the left. 
and inside that door there's a door to the right and a door to the left again mm-hmm. and I said I was on the little room in the right and my son's adoptive parents were on the ro- in the room on the left because I could hear the 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 uh, people in the adoption place going in and out yeah. talking to them yeah and uh I sat there for about a half an hour and then they came in and they took him. That's terrible. By myself. I had to go home. Nobody knew anything about it. I had to go home and pretend nothing happened. So you and went my from old Dublin. Sister, my older sister had a little boy two weeks or one week before I had my son. And I had to go home and see this child again. Uh, a few hours after giving away my own son and pretend nothing nothing was amiss listen uh, I was going to ask you about absolutely heartbreaking I was going to ask you about that journey up in the train you did have some time there with your own son what was the level of connection between the two of you then what were you feeling then and and were you he was so beautiful I just I seriously did think of getting off the train before I reached Dublin but I was afraid Mm -hmm. that I would be picked up and brought back well you probably would have been to be honest I probably I know I would have been yeah because I know of girls who left before they had their babies at all and they were picked up and brought back by the guards Mm. Were you filling in paperwork in, uh, at that time at the handover, or was it just you were literally dispossessed of no, your I child? No, I was just handing over. I wasn't. I remember being brought into the office before I left Cork and I had to sign something. Mm-hmm. But I think that that was what I always thought. Now maybe I'm totally wrong, but I always thought that was uh, that I would uh, that I was agreeing to being picked up by the guards if I didn't hand my baby to who I was supposed to hand it to. Mm-hmm. Right. I always thought at the back of my mind that that's what I signed for that day. So nobody told and you what also, you were signing? No, and I also think I signed a form saying I would never make contact with my baby again. Mm-hmm. And that would have been what, two so, two months after your baby was born? About that, yes. Yeah, and you'd no legal... This was the end of January, and he was born on the 22nd of November. Yeah, and you had no you had no legal advice? Nobody took you aside and said to you, Claire, Nobody these are your choices? From start to finish, nobody told me what was happening. Right. So, um, Nothing. Y- you know, I, I can't imagine that journey back down, the train back home, back down, but... What was hap- to go. I couldn't shed a tear. I went home, I couldn't shed a tear. Mm-hmm. And as I said, I had to go and, and meet my nephew, mm-hmm. who was one week older than my son, and pretend everything was normal. But did you shed a tear? I shed plenty of them when I went to bed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I had just, uh, because, because my parents didn't know, or none of my family knew, um, I couldn't. You know, I couldn't shed a tear in front of them. Mm, yeah. So. And how did this was a horrible, horrible time? Would have had to do something legal to to put that legally into effect. Did you have to go back? I think as well. For, yeah, and sign uh, with a solicitor. Go back where? Go back go to Dublin to sign papers with a solicitor. No, I think I I I signed the papers in Galway. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. I remember going down the stairs to a solicitor's office. Mm-hmm. Um, and a piece of paper being put in front of me, and I was told to sign it. Yeah. And and 
What, what's the timing I of that? I didn't ask what it was mm-hmm. because I knew that this was coming. Mm. Yeah. And and what was the timing of that? When was that in relation to the birth? Um, I would say a few months. Right. Probably the six months yeah. after the baby was born is usually when... They did tell me before I left that I would have to sign this paper. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you did and all of that. And you you went through all of that on your own, you know, including going all, to this. All of us, yeah. yeah. Nobody knew yeah. anything. Mm-hmm. And what state did that leave you in as, uh, as you sort of attempted to cope and go on with life? Well, you can imagine. Um, I, I, I really don't know how I got through it. I often sit and think about it now. And I would absolutely die if I thought one of my daughters had to go through what I went through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really would. Yeah. It was the most inhumane thing that any human being had to go through. Mm -hmm. And can I ask you, Claire, um, why, why, now I I know the, the answer to this, but I'm just asking you, why could you not have turned to your family when you realised you were pregnant? Well, at the time, my father was strict. Mm. Now, he was kind too, but he was very strict. Uh, he was a man of those mm-hmm. those times. He was brought up strict himself and he knew nothing else. Yeah. My mother was a very kind-hearted person. Um, I often think if I had told her, she would have kept me at home. Mm. But there were eight children in the family. She just about was able to rear them Mm. because times were very, very hard. Yeah. And I did not want to put that on her shoulders as well. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't think it was fair to her. Yeah. But there was enough other people around you, you know. um, There was, uh, and my sister has said... My older sister has said to me several times, why didn't you tell me? Yeah. You know I would have taken you in. Yeah. But I was I was afraid to tell anyone. I was ashamed to tell anybody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I supp- really was ashamed to tell them. Yeah, I suppose it was been treated as a shameful thing and uh, and you were sort of dragooned into a whole uh, sequence of actions. You never really got a chance to get your feet well, under Well, I you. knew of a, uh, yeah. a person in the village I, I came from um, who had had a baby and she kept her baby and everybody just laughed at her, you know, and, and kind of looked down their noses at her and um, always. Yeah. And I thought, I don't want to be like that woman. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I think also the other part of it is that um, you know, rather than you know, people incur- even if somebody encouraged you maybe to engage with your parents, that at least you know, as you said there, that your mum, you know, might have helped you. To- um, uh, things would have been totally different yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and I wouldn't have spent forty-eight years of my life searching for my son. Yeah. So, have you gone you know, on to meet your son? Yes, I have. Yes. And how's that? And going? I have a lovely relationship with them. Mm-hmm. That's lovely. And you say it was a long search. I mean, how did you set about getting that reunion with your son? Well, I had my name on a few different sites on uh, in the and in the adoption sites and that. Mm-hmm. Um, not my name. I had my son's name, mm-hmm. the name I had given him, mm-hmm. and his date of birth. And just said that I would like to get in touch. But he, in the meantime, had been searching for me. And two years before I got his message, he had sent, he had sent a message to me. And it was two years afterwards that I got that message. Uh, he sent it to me through Facebook. Well, I think because he wasn't one of my friends, it went into something else. It went into the other and messages. I'm, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm right. not very familiar with the computer. I can just do the basics. But one night I was um, going playing a word game 
mm. and I was looking for the word game and I saw these messages and other in brackets one yeah. Yeah. and I thought I wonder what that is now and I clicked on it and I I could not believe I had a message from him wow. that he was looking for me but when I looked at the date it was just two years before that he had sent it wow so it sat there for two years it was there for two years wow did he you get some fright did you two years before that yeah did you get some fright I really <laughs> got a, I got a fright for the simple reason that I hadn't told my daughters all right the shame was still with me yeah so it took me about three weeks to pick up the courage <laughs> to actually tell my daughters mm. And I don't know to this day why I hadn't told them before. Mm. Um, Because Um, one of my daughters has adopted two children herself. Yeah. Right. So I had been through that process with her. Mm. And, you know, it was heartbreaking. Yeah. But I just, I couldn't tell her then because I didn't want to take away from her joy. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, can I ask you something? How long did it take you to pick up the courage to reply to the two-year-old message? Well, I had to tell the girls first. Oh, I see. (laughs) Okay. I I just, I just, I would get the courage to do it and I'd go and go to ring them and I'd have the courage last by the time I get through to them. Right. Yeah, a bit like... But one day I just did it out of the blue. I hadn't intended doing it when I did. But it just came out of the blue. I was talking to one of my daughters and I said, where are you? Could I, could I meet you in my other daughter's house? And yeah. she said, yes. So they were absolutely over the moon when I told them. Wow. They were so, because they always wanted a brother. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, of course, that night, uh, they thought they would have been found by morning. <laughs> um, we all got to, my daughter rang the adoption agency in Cork and we they just started there and then and they worked really hard on it um, then they rang the adoption because I wasn't really able to do anything I was just totally no mm-hmm. and yes yeah um, the following day she rang the adoption agency in Dublin and they gave us an appointment for, now this was in November, they gave us appointment an appointment for February. So we went up there and uh, we explained to the one uh, that we spoke to that um, I'd had a message on Facebook and she said yes. She said they, he did come in, she said, uh, few years ago because he changed his address and he came in and left us a new one. Right. So I said, is he in Ireland? And she said he is. Very good. And uh, of course we started crying. We were so delighted that he was in Ireland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, then she said, she had my notes there and she was reading it out and she said, is it still the same father? (laughs) And I looked at her (laughs) as if to say... I thought my daughter would pull her over the table. <laughs> um, I was going to tell her, no, I changed them every six months. <laughs> but it was such a stupid question to ask me, was it still the same father? Yeah, said, yeah. Of course it's the same father. <laughs> but um, anyway, she said that she would organise a meeting with us, mm-hmm. uh, that she would write to him and tell him. So she wrote to him anyway, and I started checking Facebook on, that was on a Friday, I started checking Facebook on a Monday, and the following Monday, and uh, on Wednesday, I had a message back from him. He had just received the letter. So there was no organizing through the adoption uh, place in South Ann Street for us. We just did it ourselves. Mm -hmm. He came down a couple of weeks later, uh, to Galway, himself and his uh, son, Brilliant. and his partner. Yeah. And we had a beautiful night, and he was so happy. Brilliant. He was really over the moon to have found us. 
Yeah. Right. And, you know, for him, what had it meant to him? Did he give you an indication of the well, depth of that for him? For a start, his, his uh, birth father was dead when he went looking for him. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was very happy to have met me anyway. Yeah. You know, because the girls had said to me, now maybe he's just looking for health information or something. You have to be prepared. He may not want a relationship with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I just wanted to know he was all right and that he had a happy life, which he did. He had a very, very happy life. Very good. But he did tell me when he was 21, he was in an accident. And because I have a rare blood group, he also has it. And he nearly died oh. because they couldn't get the blood that he needed. Right. Now, I thought it was terrible that they couldn't have got in touch with me then. They had my address, my name, everything. Yeah. You know, to yeah. help him out. Yes. But yes. they didn't. Mm-hmm. And uh, your relationship, so, uh, have you still got a continuing relationship now? And, and what's the... Yes, he's coming down again now this weekend for my 17th birthday. Ah, that's lovely. So, um... You're having a big celebration, are you? We are. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. And thank God the celebrations now that I go to, I don't be crying. Yeah, yeah. Before, it didn't matter what I went to. And especially any time that... You know, my, I told you about my nephew who was a week older than him. Yeah. Well, I cried at his communion. I cried at his christening. I cried at his confirmation, at his birthdays, everything. Yeah. Because he reminded me of my, my son all the time. It was so close. Yeah. Now, can I just ask you, yeah. um, Claire, just um, in relation to the Commission of Inquiry into the mother and baby homes, have you had, have you met with them? Have you applied to meet with them? No, I have I have applied to them twice and I have had nothing whatsoever, not even an acknowledgement that they got my applications. When did you make your first application? I made my first application about possibly, I think, 19 or uh, 2015, I think. Yeah. And I made the other one last year. Right. And uh, uh, you heard nothing. Did you try and get in touch with them, uh, phone them? or? I did ring uh, twice and I got no reply. Unbelievable. And um, then because my husband is not well, I didn't pursue it because I thought, well, if they give me a, a, an appointment and I can't take it, then because uh, there are days when I cannot leave the house. Yeah. But... Um, I didn't pursue it after that. I said I'd wait until they sent it to, to me. But so you're still, for, you're still waiting. You're still waiting. I'm them. still waiting. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and yes. Um, what what would you like to see coming out of the commission of inquiry? I mean, do you hold out any hope for justice? Well, I did until recently when um, that last statement was made uh, by Catherine Saboni. Um, you know, they just threw the whole thing back in our face, uh, saying we did not suffer. Mm. They weren't there. We all suffered. There was nobody there that I know of that didn't suffer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, there was... You the know, saying we didn't suffer was the biggest slap in the face to any one of us. Yeah, yeah. Well, there seems to be a sort of uh, a criteria where they think unless there was actual direct physical abuse of you or direct work exploitation of you without pay, that somehow you, you know, passed otherwise unscathed through this process. But there was all of those. Oh, yes. But there was all of those. Mental, but, the but mental abuse often is a hell of a lot worse than physical abuse. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And the mental abuse is, is yeah, no. there always. Uh, what do you feel yeah. about what happened? What do you feel about the responsibilities that people didn't live up to? Uh, what do you feel about what you want to see? Uh, well, I think we should we should all be, you know, uh, acknowledged for what we've been through, and mm-hmm. you know, to to just tell us they're sorry. And that it should never have happened. Because mm-hmm. mm. at the moment, I am totally against the Catholic Church. Yeah. 
not just at the moment, I've been that way most of my life because of what I saw, the way they treat people. And would you be like, um, a bit like myself and, and some of the other mothers, that we actually, for me personally, I actually want financial, you know, I, I want well, redress. Well, at the moment there is nothing, Kathy, there is nothing else they can give us. Exactly. They can't you know, restore our can lives. They, give us at this stage they would make any difference to us. Yeah, yeah. We were never offered counselling. We were never offered anything. Yeah. And even since the you know, commission, we haven't been offered... Even since the we've commission... We've been offered nothing. No. Mm-hmm. No. You know, but yet they can let all these... These large organisations and banks and everything... Yeah. Do what they like. But they can't afford to give us a few bob just to... Yeah. Pay for whatever we need to have done for ourselves. Yeah. 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 So just one more, one more question... Did you ever go back to take up your nursing? I didn't, no. No, yeah. I didn't. That career was gone because I couldn't afford to go back again. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I just took a job in, in, in yeah. my own country and that finished my nursing. Yeah, I think an awful lot of us found that, you know, um, if we had got career hopes and our prospects that, you know, once we'd be spent time in mother and baby homes, that we were so traumatised that we couldn't get back to where we'd left off. No, you couldn't, no. No, no. Mm-hmm. You just couldn't. Yeah. Uh, lifelong uh, effects you you had of that, really, while you waited for that reconnection. It makes you think if we'd all had a different approach to it, that, that you know, that could have happened a lot earlier. Your reconnection. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's so much time. 48 years. That's too long, really, wasn't it? Oh, it is. Yeah. 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 When you wonder every day of your life where they are, what they're doing, whatever, you never, ever forget it. Yeah. Yeah. You don't. Mm. Thankfully, you had that and have had the happy ending. I'm so glad that that, that was. It's the changed end. my life. Yeah. Really? Would just put it as strongly yes, as that? this has changed my life. If I die tomorrow, I'll die happy. Having met my son. Yeah. I've never heard anybody put it as as strongly as that. But I can, I can understand. Well, that's the way I feel. Well, I can understand with the length of time. I will die fulfilled. I hope people who are not familiar with the deep emotions that go with all these issues hear and understand the importance of reaching out considering what you just said and that's a very yeah. important thing you've said today I think yeah yes so do you think okay we, we'll leave it at that Claire for the moment okay and uh, thank you for your testimony uh, thanks very much Claire okay you're welcome and we're back next week with uh, another witness on uh, Tuesday next that's right yeah okay look forward to that and I hope you take the time to join us for that next week. If you'd like to get notified of it, just click on subscribe. Look forward to seeing you then. Bye for now. We walk the road now, the road of darkness. We've walked that road to the very end We could not see before the sunset We could not see before the dawn The feel of strength now in your father's arm With no fear or no alarm I've come here to unlock your dreams Dispel the darkness, draw the light so near Don't close heaven's way Don't close it at all Don't close heaven's way